Let's pray. Papa, we thank you so much for today. We thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to minister. We ask you to continue to lead, direct, and guide us. We ask God for your wisdom, your insight, your understanding, your revelation, God, to flow and to function right now in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you. And Father, we ask God that you would invade our lives today with revelation and understanding and knowledge. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So as I said, we will be talking today about the image of the kingdom. This is part three. We're just going to go right into uh, some uh, little notes. And uh, as we go into these little bitty notes that I have, we're just going to do a quick review. I know some people online may not actually know any of this stuff. So um, I do want to do a quick review for you all. Okay. So let's do a quick review here. All right. Here we go. A statue is an image. We are created in his image. It is his law that gives us his image. Um, statue is a law. And of course, a portrait, a portrait uh, of image form. So now law equals statue, statue equals the portrait. Um, and then uh, plus uh, the image equals the actual form itself. And so, uh, yes. No, we've been learning that from from uh, the week ago. So here's the first thing, and I'm going to briefly go over these just so we can kind of skim through this. I don't want to keep you all too long today. Uh, here's the first thing you got to understand: law of liberty. I covered this last time. You have to go to back to the last broadcast to listen to this. Um, but I covered this uh, James one twenty five and James two and twelve. Here's what we understand from those scriptures. Um, the law of liberty gives us the ability to have permanent, uh, permanent perfection. Ability to have permanent perfection. Number two, remembrance of citizenship rights. Remembrance of citizenship rights. The law of liberty allows us to have that remembrance of citizenship rights. Number three, uh, it is the representer of the rights of full citizenship. Representative of the rights of full citizenship. Number four, judgment by, through, for, about, and in freedom. Say that again. Judgment by, through, for, about, and in freedom. This is what the law of liberty gives us, all right? Language and native dialects, speaking in tongues. So when you hear people talk about, and it's so weird because we live in a culture now where everybody talks about you shouldn't speak in tongues, you know. Uh, man, what is that speaking in tongues stuff? And yet speaking in tongues, it's what the law of liberty gives us the ability to do. And yet speaking in tongues it is our native dialect. The day I received Jesus, my native, uh, or actually my nationality changed in that day. And in that day, I was able to receive Jesus. Um, well, I was actually able to receive the dialect of the kingdom of God. All right. And that, of course, we know that dialect is speaking in tongues. All right. Number six, behavior modification uh, to the community and culture. Uh, the law of liberty allows me to change my behavior, to literally modify my behavior to the community. Community, break down that word, common, uh, C-O-M-M, -M, unity. is common unity. So in order to uh, have a community, it literally means to have a common unity and a culture and a culture and of course we know culture cannot be given without cultivation so we are given our culture through cultivation and i don't really want to uh, because we have a negative connotation on the word cult but a cult literally is a centralized thought and focus led by a leader now um we know that cults have been bad but actually when you're talking about a culture it's a cultivated thought that is common in the unity of, of those members or participants within that community uh, or that particular organization. So that's number six. Number seven, benefits and verdicts according uh, liberation. Um, so in other words, we have, there, there are, I'm sorry, uh, beliefs and verdicts according to uh, according to the liberation. So in other words, the law of liberty gives us beliefs and verdicts according to the, the liberality that we have in Christ Jesus. Now, let's get into, and I'm going to still, I'm going to do, a couple of these slides are going to be uh, just review for those people um, who I know uh, may not necessarily understand it. All right.
All right. So Constitution, let's go over this again for the, what, the fifth week in a row? What, third week in a row? Constitution literally means this, law, regulation, body of rules, customs, establishment, acting, um, action of settling, condition settled, to cause to stand. Let me make sure I'm seeing. Oh, okay, hold on, Precious, let me go back. Said you moved too fast. I'm recording it. It will be one of my daughters. Hurry up and write. Jesus, I'm live. See the things you do for your kids. I'm telling you. Write, child, write. And then let me know when you, let me know when you didn't wrote it all down. I'm talking to one of my spiritual daughters. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Do you got it all yet? Y'all pray for my daughter in the gospel. Her hand is moving slow today. Thank you. All right, let's go on. Here we go. So constitution means this. And of course, these are these just, just reviews. So look at this. Constitution means law, regulation. It also means body of rules, customs, establishment. Um, customs, establishment, um, action of settling, uh, condition settled. To cause to stand. Now watch this. To cause to stand, to set up, to fix, to place to form something new, and then it also causes physical health. This is what the Constitution does in any country, and in the kingdom of God, it's no different. Uh, there is physical health found and embedded within every Constitution. There is character that is actually character and personality of a nation is developed from the Constitution. Okay, uh, uh, mode of uh, mode of organization. Um, of state and kingdom, system of fundamental principles by which a community is governed, by which a community is governed. It also means to set. It also means law determining the fundamental political, I mean, the, sorry, laws for determining the fundamental um, policies or uh, political agenda or political arena. It also means uh, principles Principles of, of a government composition. Um, the point, let me kind of take this off real quick so I can see. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, principles of a government composition. It also means to point to an office, represent, form, and then it means to make institute. It's so weird because um, when somebody asks you, and I asked somebody this question not long ago. Um, what is an American? What is a Canadian? What is a Jamaican? What is a Chinese? What's a Puerto Rican? Right? So what are these things? We, th these are things we don't know. What, what are these things, right? Um, now, let me ask you this. <laughs> what does it mean to be in the United States? What does it mean to be in Mexico? What does it mean to be in Canada? What does it mean to be in Cuba? What does it mean to be in Spain? See, these are things that we, that we talk about we really don't have a clear understanding on. And I, I'm bringing this up for a point because it's in the Constitution that we learn the character, we learn the personality, we learn the, the actual mode or model of an organization. It is in the Constitution that we find out actually how to navigate within the framework. Of that. So let me make this really simple. If you don't have Constitution, you can't actively be a citizen. Without Constitution, there is not a centralized thought. Write that down. Without constitution, there was not a centralized thought. So when you're talking about the kingdom of God, 
if all of us can look at the word of God, now I'm not talking about specifics in terms of specific assignments. I'm talking about the governmental constitution according to scripture. What is that constitution for every single citizen of the kingdom of God? Okay, that constitution is the same across every board. So when you come in, when you come across people and you ask them, what does it mean to be kingdom? And they cannot give you a definite answer. It means they're not reading the constitution because the, the Bible lays out what it means, what it actually lays out what kingdom is. Okay, when you ask somebody, what does it mean to be a citizen of God? I'm not talking about your interpretation. What is written in the Constitution? Not what you interpret, but what is there that is two plus two that equals four? Okay, so some of the stuff I'm talking about, Constitution brings a solidarity and a uh, synchronization of thought. Write that down. Constitution brings solidarity and synchronization of thought. I can sum that up in just saying this. Constitution brings synergy. Constitution brings synergy. So, and I'm saying this because a lot of people have their different dynamics and perspectives on the kingdom of God. And I'll be trying to find out where these folks be getting this stuff from. <laughs> because some stuff in the kingdom is just basic. It's just basic, right? It's just basic thought. There, there is no... Uh, in-depth revelation when it comes to certain things in the kingdom. And I see a lot of people who who actually go into the thought and process of what kingdom is. And a lot of people uh, who interpret the kingdom, um, I don't know where they're getting it from. Now, they may be getting personal, which is very, very, very dangerous, might I add, uh, to take personal revelation and, and, and kind of uh, cite it as your own, I think is a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, but I've seen people do that. I've seen people take their personal revelation and make it a kingdom perspective and law. So a lot of things that I'm showing you, I'm showing you scripture because, for one, we can all agree that scripture is scripture. There is no per se interpretation in how I define scripture. Now, there will be times when I will communicate this is what God gave me or etc. But if anybody can take you to the word of God and show you in scripture what something means, then we have to be willing to make the necessary adjustments on our end so that we're able to line up with what the word is saying. So what I'm telling you is this, the word of God in terms of the constitution is a, is a mathematical equation, which means there is an algorithm to the kingdom of God. I'm going to go deeper. There are natural laws that govern the kingdom of of God, that if any hand, if black hand, white hand, I'm going to say something crazy here, if even the unsaved hand works inside the premises and the laws, the natural laws of the kingdom of God, they will get results. This is why I come the Bible says of the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, but the violent take it by force. And, and, and then it goes and says that, that many rush into that kingdom. Okay. And so in other words, the world is bumping into stuff that we're not even bumping into. Constitution is the synchronization. I'm y'all probably gotta go back and because I'm just flowing how because I don't have that in my notes. I don't know exactly how I said it. Um <laughs> I don't know how I said it. Um uh yeah, I don't know. I'm not even gonna try to take a stab at that. I'll send out the recording, you all to be able to get this at a later time. You have to go back and listen to it. Um, because I'm just flowing right now. That's not in my notes. So here's what you have to understand is is you know, when, when we're talking about the constitutional concepts of how to break down the particular laws of God. Don't listen to the message in grace that talks about, and I hear people say this all the time when they talk about grace, when they say that you don't need uh, the law, I'm, I'm sorry, grace takes care of the law. Let me go to the next thing so y'all can write that down as I'm talking. Okay, so let me let me kind of let y'all write that down while I'm talking. So, so, um, I've heard people mention things as it pertains to um, the kingdom of God. And as they're talking about it in regards to that, a lot of people are really uh, making it an abstract, well, not abstract, they're making a direct point to really point out that, that uh, within grace, within the grace message, they're actually saying within the grace message that um, you don't need the law. There is no law in grace. There, you know, you know, they're saying that well, you know, grace, you know, there's no law in grace. You know, we don't have grace in the law. And yet that I haven't found that. I haven't found that to be true. I have not found uh uh you know 
that to be true as it pertains to the law of God. Um, I haven't found it to be true that there is no, uh, well, let me say it this way. I have not found it to be true that, that, that because grace came, you don't need law. I haven't found that to be true. Now, maybe there are people who have, but I haven't seen that in the scripture. Now, here's one thing you have to realize. The letters that Apostle Paul and them write does not override, nor does it negate what our king said. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. And a lot of people, they allude to what Paul says when Paul says, and, and Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. But a lot of people allude to what Paul says when he, when he begins to talk about the law versus grace, they begin to look at his revelation as a some stratum of what we should use in, in dealing with the law. That's a huge problem there because Jesus said he did not come to annihilate or destroy the law. So if we're making statements as it pertains to the actual law itself, we have to make sure we're making those statements uh, succinctly as it pertains to the law itself, okay? Um, Right. Right. So what we have to understand as we begin to teach on this even more in depthly, uh, we have to begin to understand that the thought process that we must have as we begin to navigate through and we begin to understand more about the constitutional uh, assertions and assessments of the law that you cannot operate within this law without grace. You got to have grace. And you got to have law. You got to have both in order to operate in the fullness of it. So I'm kind of just saying that. But again, um, just like, so an American citizen is an American citizen based on the Constitution. So now let me say it this way. You are, I really got to say it this way. The person who knows less about the Constitution of America is less of an American. So if you take somebody who is an immigrant who comes over to our country and they learn the Constitution of America, they are more American than someone who was born here. Why? Because this particular person is actually walking in the nuances of what it means to be a, an, an American. Okay? So... You know, just because you were born on American soil doesn't make you an American if you don't know the statutes and the Constitution. If you're not walking in the constitutional law of what it means to be an American, then, then you're not an American. So we are an American based on mindset, watch this, and based on the obedience to the law of the Constitution, which gives us right here the constitutional the law. That's what makes us kingdom, kingdom citizens. You're not just a kingdom citizen. Now, you are a kingdom citizen by receiving Jesus Christ, but you do not become a full citizen and you do not walk into citizenship rights unless you are able to understand the constitution of the kingdom. Okay? So we have many illegitimate, I should say illegitimate, we have many immigrant citizens in the kingdom of God, meaning they're immigrant because of their ignorance. They're an immigrant because of their ignorance. Now, let me show you the scripture because I kind of went to this earlier when I was with somebody and I actually showing them this. And hopefully I'll be able to pull it back up. Um, let me look this scripture up once again. Um, Hosea 4 and 6. This is not in my notes, and I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself. Hosea 4 and 6. I got some good stuff to get to today, y'all. I'm, I'm kind of laying some other foundation here for, for a reason. Hosea 4 and 6. Look at this. I'm going to show you something that is important. Y'all need to write this down, this scripture down. Hosea 4 and 6 says this, and I'm reading out the New King James Version. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge because you have rejected knowledge i also will reject you from being my priest okay because you have forgotten the law of your god constitutional law i also will forget your children and i don't want to go any further than that what, I, what god is saying is this we always read that part the a part that well, you know people perish for lack of knowledge but we don't read down to see what god is saying the the completion of that thought is this it's not just the people perish from the lack of knowledge people perish from the lack of knowledge and to add to them perishing for the lack of knowledge on top of them perish for the lack of knowledge um god is also saying if you don't go get knowledge i'll reject you for your ignorance 
So let me say it this way. An ignorant priest will not be able to serve. Write that down. An ignorant priest will, be, will not be able to serve. This is not in my notes. Just write it down. An ignorant priest will not be able to serve. Okay, so when you are ignorant, you cannot, you, you, you will not be able to serve God in the priestly order. God, God will not allow ignorant people to serve. And this is why I come a lot of people who are pastoring church and over, uh, over great masses of people are really, you don't feel the anointing. God is not really, because I always wonder, God, why is it that, why is it that it took me so long to understand the kingdom? Why is it, why is it that I've never heard the kingdom taught from anybody? And I'm talking about proper kingdom, not using the kingdom label, but teaching traditions and the, the traditions of men and religion. Like, why haven't I heard the kingdom message? Well, one thing God began to let me know is that you were always seeking. That's why you end up actually finding it. But the reason why you have never heard the kingdom message is the men and women of God who you have been around, who you've been connected to, because they refuse to get knowledge. I have rejected them from being my priest. So in other words, they're serving my people but they are serving my people in ignorance. And because they are serving my people in ignorance, I have rejected them in their calling and their gifting until they become enlightened or get knowledgeable about the real message. So with that being said, there are a lot of people who are called by God, anointed by God. They stand in pulpits and some are on uh, Facebook lives and, and they're doing all kinds of Zoom broadcasts. And yet God says, I have rejected them because they have rejected the knowledge of this kingdom message. And that's the message that God is teaching. And the reason why I said that of the kingdom because we're dealing specifically with that but knowledge in general god says when you reject knowledge in general he says i'll reject you so this is knowledge not just in scripture but knowledge all around you which means people who are ignorant will not be able to function as god's ordained spiritual leaders to people all right so let's move forward all right now we see here constitutional law i'm saying a lot of stuff here today and i got to get going because my time is getting away from me. Praise the Lord. All right, look at this. All right, constitutional law, a body of law which defines the role, um, which defines the role, powers, and structure of different entities within a state, the executive, legislator, and judiciary, or executive legislation or legislative and judicial branches of that particular government. All right, so constitutional law, this is what it covers. The constitutional law is a body of law which defines the power roles or the roles of power and structures of different entities within the government or within the state. So it's the constitutional law that shows us the power role. So if you if you are saying that well you don't need law, you, you we got grace we don't need law. Then how do we define the power roles? How do we define how God delegates authority within the body of Christ? We don't know because there's no law that will bring us to synergy, which is the law of constitution that causes us all to see what that structure of power is. And there is power structure in the kingdom of God. Okay? So Paul talks about this. When you go into Paul, uh, Paul when you get into 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 17, 27 through 28, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 27 through 28, Paul breaks down how the church should be designed. So one of the things, two things he does not mention in that discourse. He does not mention the bishop, and he does not mention the pastor as being a part of the ecclesia, which is the cabinet members selected by the king himself. We're going to go over that at a later time. Just write it down. OK, so he talks about the cabinet members. The word church does not mean the gathering of people to do praise and worship. That is not church. OK, I did a whole teaching on this on Facebook. I'm going to have to upload it at some point, but I did a whole teaching on what is church really? You need to go look that up because I did a whole teaching on what it means to be the ecclesia. Uh, a lot of us don't understand that the uh, uh, ecclesiastical order um, 
Actually, the word ecclesia or church is not a church that is not a word that Jesus gave. He adopted a word from the culture, from the Roman culture. Okay, so the word church literally meant a meeting together of, of citizens to discuss the constitutional law of the king. I'm going to say that again. The word church means, and you can look this up, um, it actually means in the Roman culture, it means the meeting together of citizens. Okay, above the age of 18, which means you had to be a legal adult, okay, to discuss the constitutional law of the emperor or king. So when people came together at, at church, when people came together to the ecclesia, which is the church in those days, they came together for the specific premise and basis of discussing the constitutional law of the king. So now, when you look at what we call church today, and we're not even discussing the kingdom, which is, which is the mind, the will, and the heart, and the thought of the king expressed towards the citizens, okay? We're not, and we're not doing that. Then what are we doing? When the Bible says, don't forsake the assembly together of believers, okay? What, so that word there, assembly, is not going to a building. That word assembly is a judicial term. It's a governmental term, okay? So it literally means do not, do not stop coming together. Matter of fact, it was a law that if you were above the age of 18, you had to be in the ecclesia. You had to go to church. It was, it, it was non-negotiable. You had to go to church to discuss what was the emperor's, what, what the emperor or Caesar had actually said to the citizens. And if you missed too many of those, they imprisoned you, they, they jailed you, and even you were prosecuted up, up, up until the point of death because every citizen was held accountable for what the king or the emperor or the Caesar had declared over that region. I, I'm getting too far off into that. That's the premise of the constitutional law, you all. So when you come across people who say, oh man, we ain't gotta, you know, we ain't gotta walk in this and da 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 da, da. man, run from these people. <laughs> these people are not, and, and, and they say in their kingdom, and they're talking about their kingdom without law, run, run, run. Because, uh, uh, you know, like people say, like, like and, and I'll make this statement, um, the church that we call church now is not really what the church was designed to do. What I just mentioned, a lot you can attest and adhere to and say, that's never happened. Matter of fact, I've never even heard the kingdom in church. So that means you have been a citizen going to a religious tradition. I don't care how anointed they are. Help me hold the ghost. I don't care how anointed they are. You are a citizen going to a religious traditional gathering of people. You are not going to an ecclesia. You are not going to a church because that was not the design of church, okay? So a lot of times I'll make statements when I'll say, you know, like I've, I've, I've even made the statement recently, I, I don't consider myself to be a Christian because modern Christianity and modern Christendom, okay, does not represent and emulate what it meant to be a Christian in Jesus' time. It just doesn't emulate that. OK, so as a citizen, you are required to be under kingdom teaching. You are required to assemble yourselves with kingdom thought. That's the whole point of being the Ecclesia, because the word that we use now for the presidential cabinet is the same word they used back then for the Ecclesia. So the literal Ecclesia or church is literally a personal selected cabinet chosen by the king himself to discuss, dispute, debate, and express and delegate kingdom law. If you're not doing that in your ecclesia, in your church, then you are coming into a religious traditional gathering. You are not in a church setting. I'm gonna say something stronger then I'll move on because I, I didn't I have to teach that another time. But in those days, they didn't have praise and worship in church. They didn't have that. They came together and discussed the law. The law, and I'm even talking about church. I'm, I'm talking about Paul and, and, and Silas and Timothy and Peter and them. When they met, they didn't have all these instruments that we have in church now. They met to discuss the kingdom of God. 
That was the only reason that they came together. They met together from house to house discussing the law of the kingdom. That's what they did. I hear you, Holy Ghost. And I'm way off my notes here. I'm not even in my notes, but I'm going to give you this. Um... So I'm going to show you this in scripture because I know somebody is going to, it's always one that's going to feel like they can rebuttal this. So I'm going to squash that now. <laughs> Praise God. Um, now, write this down. Acts 28 and 31. Acts 28 and 31. Now, this is Paul. This is Paul. This is the apostle. Acts 28 verses 30 through 31. Write this down. And Paul dealt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. Now watch what Paul is in chains. Watch what Paul says. And we're still talking about constitutional law. I'm just showing you the importance of why we have to teach kingdom and why we have to teach constitutional law. It is a non-negotiable prerequisite of kingdom citizens. Look at verse 31. Now, this is what Paul was doing in prison before he died. Two years before he dies. Verse 31. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the lordship of Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Paul, in his last waking moments on this planet, did not teach salvation. Help me, Holy Ghost. He did not teach coming to Jesus. Okay. <laughs> okay, he didn't teach on healings, signs, wonders, and miracles. He didn't teach on the fivefold ministry. He, he didn't teach on none of this stuff. He didn't teach on grace. He didn't teach on faith. He didn't teach on tithing. He teach on the kingdom of God. He preached it and he taught it. So he preached it and then he taught it, which means he trained people in the kingdom of God. My point in what I'm saying is this. That's what the Ecclesia was. So every time somebody came to meet with Paul, as a citizen, they discussed kingdom thought. Now, all the things I just mentioned are, are sub points to the main point. Yes, Calvary is a sub point to the main point. Christianity would tell you it's a main point. It's not. It's a sub point. Because contrary to popular opinion, he didn't come to die at a cross. He came to restore citizens back into sons of God to enter into the kingdom of God. He came to restore sons back to the father and he came to, he came to reinstate, reinstate citizens back into citizenship. This is why he came. The cross was a means to an end. It was not the end goal. If that's the case, then why are we talking about anything beyond the cross? Let's go on, because I'm getting I'm getting hot and heated, and I ain't got a lot of time. Praise God. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Write this down. Priesthood, new laws, part four. So now let's go into this. Eternal laws. Number one, we're going to talk today about the law of Christ. Everything else I said are, are introductories to this. My message is probably only going to be in these next couple of slides we have. All right? Here we go. We're going to talk today about the law of Christ, all right? So, Romans 7, 23, verse 25, and then 1 first, uh, first John 3, uh, verses 4. Let's kind of go over this. Uh, Romans 7 and 23. Romans 7 and 23. Romans 7 and 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Jump down to verse 25. Excuse me. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so then, with the law, I'm sorry, so then, with the mind, I, might, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, 
the law of sin. You see that? So we're going to talk today about the law of Christ. Let's jump over to 1 John 3, 1 John 3 and 4, 1 John 3 and 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You see that? Uh, so uh, just kind of want to bring it up. Is, is that is that the right? That may not be the right scripture. Anyway, let's go further into this. That is the right scripture. I'm sorry. I just got to break this down. All right. So number one, here's the first thing you understand about the law. Now, the law of Christ is a real law. That's what it is. Lord Jesus, help me. Holy Ghost, you know you're awesome. You, you're just awesome. The Holy Ghost love y'all because he wouldn't even let me forget what I wanted to remember. Look at this. Go to Romans 8 and 2. I'm going to say this really quick. The Romans 8 and 2. For the law of, for the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. So there is a law of the spirit in Jesus Christ. There actually is a law of the spirit in Jesus Christ, okay? Um, and I talked about the law of the spirit. You have to go check out the other um, teachings on this. But I did cover the law of the spirit um, not so long ago. And yes, so I wanted to cover this stuff a little bit more. I hope y'all understand and it's a little bit more in depthly today as we're going deeper into this. Um, let me get this on here. Um, where is it at? Where is it at? Where is it at? Yellow. Yes, Jesus. All right, Galatians, Galatians six and two. Galatians six and two. Write this down. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So fulfill the law of Christ. So you see that in the word. There is a law. There is a law of Christ. You've seen that in scripture. There is a law of Christ. So here we go. There is a necessity in the law of Christ. There is a necessity or a need in the law of Christ or a need for the law of Christ. So the law of Christ is needful for every citizen. Number two, look at this. Law of Christ helps and ensures connectivity and unity. Write that down. Law of Christ helps and ensures connectivity and unity. You cannot have connection and unity without the law of Christ. You cannot. It's completely impossible. Number three. Law of Christ is built in every created thing. So the law of Christ is a built-in thing in every created thing. And I, I'll break this down more. Uh, all I will say to you on this point right here as I go deeper into this thought is that when you begin to look at, when you begin to look at the DNA chromosome, okay, um, X, X, in Rome, in Rome, in Roman numeral numerals means 10. But X also is where we get the word Christus or Christ from, according to Greek, according to the Greek uh, terminology and Greek understanding, okay? So we get Christus from the, from the number X or the letter X, but we also get 10 also means, uh, 10 also means X in Roman numeral numbers. Now, I'm saying to say to you that when you look at the DNA, the chromosome inside the, 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 the human body, we have the X and the Y chromosome. We have the X and the Y chromosome, okay? So as we have the X and the Y chromosome, um, in, in the DNA structure, as we have the X and the Y chromosome, you're now seeing Christ, and we know the Y there is the word Yah, because in um, Hebrew dialect and language, there is no J. Okay, J is translated to Y. So the XY in the chromosome of man is actually Christ God. That's what it actually means. It actually means Christ and God. So inside your chromosome is built in the law of Christ. Help me, Jesus. The law of Christ is embedded with inside your chromosome. Yep, yep, yep. I bet you didn't know that, but yep, it's there. So the law of Christ is embedded within my chromosome. All right. And so is the law of God, because I just told you why means why means uh, J, there is no J, there's why. So why actually will we get the word Yod or Yahweh from? Uh, actually, the word that saying, and this is where interesting, 
the way that the chromosome appears up on uh, the micro, the, uh, the, the micro, I'm trying to think of the word, the microchip, not microchip, but the, the, the thing they actually scan, um, when it shows up, that Y is actually shaped in the same facet, in the same form, that the Hebrews actually write the letter Y in their language. So we know that the Y in the human DNA is the direct representative of Yod, Y, Y A H, or Jai, however you want to pronounce it, which is the word God. All right. And so we have to understand it. So the law of God, right, and the law of Christ is imprinted in your DNA. That's the point I'm making. All right. So you see point number three here. Law of Christ is built in every created thing. Built in every created thing. Point number four. Abuse is impossible without the law of Christ. Without the law of Christ, without understanding him being in every living thing. So right now, uh, even in your DNA, do you not know you're one, you're 99% human. And if you were to get another strand, just, just one more DNA strand, you're, you're one step away from being a chimpanzee. You're one step away from being a plant. So literally the human race is only a, 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 a chromosome, a helo bond or a helo fix away from, away from being something different. Okay, that is crazy to me. I, I mean, that's God, but you're just one strand away from being a dog, a cat, something else. If you had, instead of 24, you had 25 strands, and that 25th strand was something completely different, immediately you would change into that by genetics, by genetics. Okay, so I say that to say that abuse is impossible without the law of Christ. Without understanding the, the, the DNA within us, without understanding that Christ, the law of Christ is embedded within every created thing, you, there will be an abuse that's impossible for whatever that thing is. All right, so we have to honor the law of Christ. This, this is the new priesthood law that we are given as we walk into citizenship. Point number five, absence of the law of Christ leads to experimentation. When you do not understand the law of Christ that is embedded with inside every single created person, every single created thing, then you lead to, it's led to experimentation and religion and Christianity is a religion, okay? Uh, it's Christianity is just experimenting. If you're not talking about the kingdom, you're experimenting. Every other message without reference to the kingdom message is experimentation. And I've been guilty. I am telling you as a leader, as a pastor and an apostle, I have been guilty of experimenting in God's word. And that's why we don't see consistent results, because we're experimenting with something that is a law. Now, here is the beauty of the law. This is not a point, but write it down. Here is the beauty of the law, whether it's the law of Christ, the law of the spirit, the law of liberty, or the law of God. Here is the beauty of the law. The beauty of the constitution of the kingdom is this. If you work the law, black hand, white hand, uh, it doesn't matter. If you learn how to work these laws, Jesus Christ. Success is inevitable. Now, here's the other part. Not only is success inevitable, right? Success or spiritual blessings are irrevocable. Jesus Christ. Success and spiritual blessings are irrevocable. What do you mean? What I'm telling you is this. If you learn what I'm teaching you, the law will naturally work even when you're not always up to par. If you stay within these laws and honor these laws he has put in place in the kingdom of God, these laws will work for you even when you're not working. These are principles. And the devil knows this. That's why he wants to teach us other stuff because he knows the law. And actually, Satan has been using laws against us. Okay, I won't get off into that. That's the kingdom of darkness. I won't go there. Just know this, I'll say this on that footnote, and I'm not going to go too more deep in that. If you are ignorant of the kingdom, then you are under the demonic kingdom of the enemy. In other words, if you are ignorant to the kingdom thought and concepts, then you, then you are operating in the kingdom of darkness, which is the kingdom of ignorance. 
All right. Point number six. Built into every law is the consequence for disobedience. So with inside of every law, inside of every law that governs, inside of every law, not just the law of Christ, inside of every law, if you don't obey that law, then the, the disobedience to obeying that law will result in consequence. So let me say it this way. When you don't learn how to honor the law of gravity, and you just think you're going to jump off a building, you're going to float in the air, you will die. Because if you don't honor that law, the law will kill you. So I know a lot of people say, well, this is the devil. No, 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 no. Listen to me. If you don't pay tithes and offerings, that is a law. If you don't do that, the devil as a devourer, because he goes to and fro, seek him whom he may devour, okay? He has a legal right to devour you. If, if you're not tithing and giving offerings, it's a law, <laughs> okay? So the law kills you. Watch this, not behavior. Help me, Holy Ghost. Tithing is a law, and I'm going there because that's the clearest thing to see. Tithing and offering is a law. Not just tithing, but giving offering. If you're tithing but not giving offering, Satan still has a legal right to come into your life and devour something. It's a law. Saved or unsaved, that law works. I'll make it simple. When you go plant a seed in the ground, the seed don't ask you, are you saved or unsaved, before it produces. The law of seed time and harvest works no matter what hand puts it in soil. Likewise, these laws I'm teaching you will work. And many of the worldly people are operating these laws, and they're calling it different things, and they're getting results where Christians are not. Now, they call them principles, but they're really laws. They're natural laws that have been given in this world to govern the environment and the kingdom that we rule over. The world has been tapping into it, and that's why the Bible says that, that many press into the kingdom. The world is getting result, kingdom results that we're not getting because we don't think, well, we under grace. We don't need the law. <laughs> and the world is operating in stuff that they don't, they call it other stuff. They're getting, and I'm talking about they're getting results. Financial increase is a law. You just got to learn what the law is and then work the law. All right. Number seven, disobedience to the law of Christ causes malfunction. When you disobey the natural law, which is the law of Christ, we, they call it the natural law, but I call it the law of Christ because in Christ, all things consist and all things are made. So nothing is made that is made without Christ. So God, Christ is in everything. So what they call the law of nature really is the law of Christ. Okay. When you disobey the law of Christ or the law of nature, you will cause mal function. Point number eight, the synergy to all success is obedience to law. The synergy to all success is obedience to the law. So you want to centralize your life? You want some stability? Okay, you want some success? Start obeying the laws, which means you can't drink and smoke and then wonder why you have stuff going on either with your body or in your life. This is the temple. Let me say it this way. This is the embassy of the ambassador, which you are. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this is the embassy and the actual castle of Christ the King dwelling on the inside. So before you do anything, and I haven't taught on this, but I'm going to teach on this. I'm going to teach on kingdom body. Because as God began to show me this revelation about kingdom body, if you cannot honor your body, and that's why come, I've been really diligently working on my body. Because your everybody's body, B-O-B-Y, has an assignment. Do you not know you're going to have to give an account for everything you've done in that B-O-D-Y? To Christ. In other words, Christ says you're going to have to give an account for the embassy and the castle that I stayed in while you were operating in your kingdom. And you're going to have to give an account for how you dealt with me in my castle. So if you're eating, drinking, and you're doing stuff you shouldn't be doing against this castle, you're going to have to give an account to the king. 
which also means you can cause the king in you to walk in disobedience. What do you mean by that? If you die prematurely before that king, Christ in you, can fulfill the assignment that's been given by the king of kings, you're going to have to give an account as to why your assignment came short for your abuse and misuse of that body, of that castle, of that embassy. I'm not going to go into that because I know I'm, mess I'm meddling with somebody right now. <laughs> I know I'm meddling with somebody right now because I, yeah, I can just sense that. But I'm just telling you what the Lord has been showing me. So having good health is a requirement for kingdom living. I know that's going to be hard to hear, but it's true. I know some people can't handle it, but it's the gospel. Point number nine. I'm moving on. The law of Christ causes all things to exist. Without the law of nature, which is the law of Christ, things do not exist. So when you don't honor Christ, you can't. So if you're believing God for something and you're not operating in the law of Christ, I'm trying to tell you the law of Christ is a natural law. Jesus Christ. It will work for anybody who applies it. Nothing will exist without the law of Christ. Number 10. Self-destruction of any of the laws of Christ is done through violation. In other words, you will self-destruct if you walk in the law, if you walk in the law of Christ, I'm sorry, you will self-destruct when you violate the law of Christ. You will self so built inside the law of Christ is a self-destructive, a self-destructive mechanism for violation. All those who violate the law of Christ will self-destruct. There's self-destruction, which means a lot of times we're saying it's the devil and we're destroying ourselves because we're violating a law that he has given to governors. And as I've been doing this teaching on the law, I'm telling you, I've been so convicted, but I'm so convinced and I'm so determined to walk in, in law. And I'm telling you, since I've made my mind up to walk upright and to walk according to the law of right stance with God, I mean, I've made it, and not saying I haven't thought about it before, but it's, it's more now central focused in my life, like, like the kingdom and then walking upright and then keeping the law that God has given to govern, govern all of our lives and humanity. As, as, as I've made kingdom and walking upright and keeping kingdom law my central focus, I'm telling you, I've seen God begin to do things that I was praying for and that I was honestly seeking after him to do. And he's just doing it now just because. So when I go into prayer, I no longer pray about the things I used to pray about now. Now I'm praying, Lord, help me keep law. Help me to keep your law. Lord, help me to, to remain upright. Help me to remain a law-abiding citizen who keeps the law. Help me to be a law-abiding citizen who doesn't frustrate the king. And then, Lord, help me to understand kingdom. That's, that's, that's my only prayer. Because he said everything else would be added. And I'm telling you, I am walking in that. He is starting to add things I've been praying for concerning the ministry, concerning my personal life. Just recently, God protected me in regards to something. And I'm like, Lord, where'd that come from? And God, let me know you're keeping my law. You're focusing on kingdom. You're focusing on my law. Jesus, I'm trying to help y'all, man. Well, my time is almost gone here, y'all. And I'm about ready to get up out of here. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to give y'all this. Let me see. I got, I got a few more minutes. I got a few more minutes. I'm going I'm to I'm try to get y'all in it because I know somebody going, uh, they're going to be feeling some kind of way. So let's try to, all right. So Colossians, and I kind of went over this already, but we'll do it anyway. Okay. We'll do it anyway. So go to Colossians. I hope this is making sense, you all. I hope this is making sense. Do you realize you are one obedience to one law away from breakthrough? I'm trying to tell you that seed time and harvest is a law that will work for you, not just in finances. Seed time and harvest in everything is a law. 
I'm under grace. I don't need the law. Okay. Okay, grace. Okay, grace. No results, but grace. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Colossians 1, 16 through 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. You see that? Verse 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So Jesus is what we call the law of nature, that is Christ himself. Why? All things were made by him, and nothing has a constant outside of our king, Christ Jesus. Now, look at this. Point number 11. Functionality of everything is based on the appropriate usage of the governing laws of Christ. I'm going to say that again. Functionality of everything is based on the appropriate usage. So inappropriate usage will not cause functionality. Appropriate usage, okay, of the governing laws of Christ. So you have to find out what is the law that works this? And then you have to, you have to appropriate the right usage to cause function. And I can tell you why come tithing doesn't work for people because people give tithes, but they don't ever do offering. Tithing is a prerequisite of the taxation system of the kingdom of God. You, you're supposed to pay tithe. Okay, I'm getting excited. You don't get a bonus because you do a requirement. <laughs> like you pay taxes. They give you a refund at the end of the year. And then they tax the refund, okay? So the refund that you're getting is them giving you back some, somewhat, some bit of your taxes. But nobody comes in and congratulates you because you're giving, because you're paying taxes. Likewise, there is no bonus because you're tithing. It's in the offering on top of the tithing that God gives you blessings. That's what the blessed, and see, this is the part that a lot of prosperity preachers have not been teaching. And this is why folks been missing. They've been tithing for years and they ain't seen no breakthrough. That's why. <laughs> because they're telling you to give tithes, but they're not mentioning how important it is to match your tithe with an offering. Now, offering should be spirit-led. You allow the spirit to leave you the dollar amount, but every time you give a tithe, you ought to be giving an offering. Amen. Point number 12, obedience to the law of Christ causes pre predictability. When you obey the law of Christ, it's predict the outcome is predictable. Life is not hard. I'm f Lord Jesus, I'm almost 40 and I'm just now finding this out. Life is not hard. We make life hard. Life is not hard. We make it hard. Just obey the law he put in place and watch this. Success is inevitable. It's predictable if you just work the obedience to the law. Point number 13. Existence of, existence of all things are founded in the law of Christ. Existence of all things are founded in the law of Christ. I just showed you that in scripture, so I won't go over that. Verse 14. Grace is not the absence of the laws of Christ, but the ability to keep the law. I'm going to say that again. Grace is not the absence of the laws of Christ, but the, but the ability to keep the law. Point number 15. Organization comes from keeping the law. You want to have, or, now, now notice the root word to organization is what? Organ. Where we get the word also organism, which is the body of Christ. So the body of Christ is as organized as keeping the law. So the less the law of Christ is kept, the less organized the organism is going to be. So when you look at the body of Christ, you say, man, we had this array, da, 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 da. You just talk about the body of Christ because we have no organization. Because within the organism, there is not a fervent obedience to keeping law. All right. 16. The law of Christ is inherent. And that's important because a lot of us think that we can operate in the law of Christ. I mean, a lot of us think we cannot operate in the law of Christ. We think we got to pray until we do something. No, the law, of, I just told, showed you this through chromosome and DNA. The law of Christ 
is genetically chromosomed into your very infrastructure. Christ himself is inside of you. So the love of Christ, you've got to know if the king is in you, then the law of the king is inherent within me, which means I don't have to go seek to do the law of Christ. I just got to submit and obey to the spirit's leading to the law that the king is given. So when, a, so when the Holy Ghost tells you to keep your mouth, hush, be quiet, that ain't him talking. That's the king talking. That's a law he's given you personally to keep. But we override that law. We just think we're just going to override the Holy Ghost. And every time you override that, you are, you are walking into an area where it's predictable that you will malfunction. Amen. Verse 17. Verse 17. Point number 17. Work according to the preset laws of Christ. So I'm saying to say to you, go back to the word of God, go back to the constitution and work, work according to the constitutional laws in the New Testament. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. You need a scripture. And I'm going over time for a reason because I'm going to go ahead and finish this because I, I can sense somebody needs me to finish this, okay? So I'm going to finish these slides. I got one more and then we're done, okay? And I'm going to show you a scripture here, okay? Come on now. I'm almost there, y'all. All right. Luke 16, 16. Write this down. Luke 16, 16. I'm going to give you this. Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until, were until, were until, were until, John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. So what he's saying is, Jesus said, I, I didn't do away with the law and the prophets in terms of the constitution. But he's saying in, in terms of preaching, the law and the prophets should not be preached. Now, I know that sounds confusing. Just stick with me. I'm going to bear that out uh, these next few weeks, okay? I know that sounds confusing, but just write it down. Luke 16, 16, okay? So we should not be preaching the law, uh, so we should not be preaching the law and the prophets. We should be preaching the kingdom of God because the teaching and preaching of the law of the prophets stopped after John. Okay, so when I'm talking about work according to the preset laws of Christ, it so everything everything left of of Matthew, we should not be preaching that in terms of doing an operation. Okay. Everything right of, of, of Malachi, we should be teaching on because that's our new covenant. And Jesus pulls out of the Mosaic law, the laws we should be abiding by in the Mosaic law. So does Paul, so, do, so does Peter. If it's not mentioned, hear me now, if it's not mentioned in the New Testament or the new gospel or the new covenant, then we should not be doing it. According to the Mosaic law. Now, there are certain things in the Mosaic law that we have to do. Like he said, keep all the feasts and the festivals. That's a prerequisite. Okay, there are certain things that are kind of, and I have to kind of break that down a little later on, but I want to show you that. So any preaching and teaching, that is, I don't care who the person is, because I've been guilty of this, and I've had to repent. I don't care who the person is. If you're teaching anything other than the kingdom, let me say it this way. If you're coming up with your scriptural basis in your teaching and preaching and you're using stuff left and you're not referring to stuff left to the stuff that's right of, of math. So if you're going everything from Malachi to Genesis, you're using the preach on only without making references to Matthew through Revelation, you are not teaching kingdom. I'll make that really simple. You are doing what Jesus said not to do. You are preaching what he said not to preach. You got to talk about this stuff because we're holding up the coming of the Lord. Praise God. Matthew 24 and 14 says that. 
until the message of the kingdom is preached in all the world and all the nations, the end shall not come. We are holding up the return of the Lord because we won't teach kingdom. And that's why I got a toot about it, praise God. I got an attitude. Soon as I found out kingdom, I got, oh, I got this, I got furious because I couldn't believe I, it had never been taught to me. And I, I got furious with myself that I had never taught it. And then I got more mad with myself because I taught erroneous stuff in tradition and religion. And I declare I'm not going back to teaching that stuff ever. So whoever get mad and get upset, so what? God bless you. Praise the Lord. May the Lord be with you. May he watch while we're absent one from another. Praise God. Because I'm not teaching none other than kingdom. <laughs> I'm telling you. I want Jesus to come back, praise God. I do not want to be the prohibitor from his return. All right. Let's move on. I'm getting a little animated, praise the Lord. I... Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. 18. When the kingdom laws are not, when the kingdom laws are not abstained in the citizen, there is disorder. So when you don't have the kingdom laws if they're not abstained in you, right? The Bible says this way, I hide the word in my heart that I might not sin. In other words, I hide the law of God in my heart so I do not sin against the king. If you don't do this, you're going to have disorder in your life. So you got to get the kingdom law in your heart. And that's what he said. He, he's going to write the law in your heart. That's what he, he wants to write the constitution in your heart. So you're not sinning, so you can get breakthrough at the breakthrough at the breakthrough at the breakthrough. You think God wants you in the position you're in? That's not as hard. But God said they won't keep the law. They won't keep the law. And some of you say, well, I've never heard it. And God said, I don't care if they ain't never heard. Okay, there's some people that do not know what it means to be an American citizen. And they're an American citizen. Just because they don't know it doesn't mean that the law they don't know is working against them. It doesn't matter. It's the law. <laughs> it's the Constitution. So you got to do your due diligence to repent, switch, change, and turn, and then upgrade and learn the Constitution. You are perishing because of what you don't know. Point number 19. Order is a result of keeping the law of Christ. You will only be as ordered in your life as you are available and consistent in keeping the law of Christ. Order comes from keeping the law of Christ. That's where order comes from. Order is the result, okay, of keeping the law of Christ. So when you keep the law of Christ, your life will come into order. If your life seems like it's out of alignment, it probably is if you're not keeping the law of Christ. Guaranteed it is. Number 20, and then I'm gonna let today go. I start up next week on the next slides, all right? Discipline to keep the law of Christ leads to success. When you discipline yourself to keep the law of Christ, you will have success. When you And, and, and I'm telling you, it's not that I haven't done it before. It's just that now, those are my only two focuses, the kingdom and righteousness, kingdom and righteousness. So those are my only two priorities above my wife and everything else. And you know what I mean? And when I said that before, I, 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 I realized I need to add clarity to that. Kingdom and kingdom and righteousness are the number one priority. God began to deal with me about this. Son, if you just keep kingdom and righteousness, you'll do right by everybody. Every relationship that you have, you'll do right by them. Why? Because if you're seeking the kingdom, not the king. Lord, I got to say that. I'm ending on this note. I'm not talking about pursuing God. Lord, the saints I come across are so traditional. I'm seeking God. I'm seeking, he didn't say seek God. He didn't say seek Jesus. Help me. Jesus did not say seek Jesus. Do you hear me? He said seek the kingdom. He said that's the number one priority. Seek the kingdom and your righteousness. And then everything else will be added. Your, your relationship with God will be added. Time spent in his presence will be added. Everything else will be added when you seek the kingdom, not the king. I know Tamara Man made a song. And she said, take me to the king. No, take me to the kingdom. And then somebody would ask the question, well, is it, is it seeking the kingdom, seeking the king? No, because if that was the case, Jesus would have said it. <laughs> so they're obviously two different things. Okay? Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, okay. My apostolic is kicking in at the end. 
That, that, that cannot be our pursuit. I see so many Christians talking about that, and we got masses of songs, and people talking about, I want to be in his presence. You lazy saint, you. If you don't get out of his presence and go do kingdom, we got to, Christians are just lazy. We, we just lazy. We just ain't God. Ah, that's why, oh, I just want to be in his presence. I just want, get out of his presence. I'm going to say something strong here. He didn't create you for his presence. He didn't create you for worship. He created you for kingdom. And I got a tood about it. I got an attitude with preachers who won't preach this stuff. I got an attitude with myself because I wasn't preaching it. And I got an attitude with anybody who else ain't preaching it because it's erroneous teaching. We were created for kingdom. When you go to the book of Genesis, the first and the second chapter, you don't see the words worship, prayer, none of the stuff that we preach and teach on do you see in the beginning of the Bible. It's not there. But we teach this stuff. I just want to go into God's presence. Do you not realize if you get, if you seek kingdom, you're going to be in the The Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy. Don't you know the Bible says in his presence there is no shadow of turning? When you seek the kingdom, you will get the king. But don't make the king your focus. Make the kingdom your focus. When you seek the kingdom, you'll get the king. Don't seek his presence. Seek the kingdom and righteousness. I'm trying to help y'all, man. As I'm telling you something that has changed my life in my prayer time. As I've been petitioning God in the courtrooms of heaven, as I've been bombarding God, I have literally seen God shift my life. He is shifting my life as I'm pursuing the kingdom, not the king, not Jesus, not the Holy Ghost, the kingdom. And as I'm seeking right stance with God, I have seen God start shifting stuff I've been praying about since we got to Tampa. I've seen God begin to move quicker and quickly because I've made up in my mind I'm pursuing the kingdom. I'm trying to help y'all. All right, well, I got more slides to go over, but we'll do it next week. So let's go over to the last one. Discipline keeps, a discipline to keep the law of Christ leads to success. Make it your agenda in life. Make it your life agenda. Discipline yourself. to keeping the law of Christ. Somebody says, well, what is the law of Christ? I'm telling you right here what the law of Christ is. I'm telling you what you got to do. I'm telling you what the law of Christ is right here. Now, we're going to go We're going to go further, and I'm going to begin to break down. If you want to jump ahead of me, go read, Rev, um, go read Romans, the eighth chapter, because Romans, the eighth chapter, really breaks down what the law of Christ should look like modeled in the believer. And I'm gonna, we're going to touch on this. But right now, I'm setting up all the framework so when I talk about it, you, you know, you've already dealt with the, the boundaries and the perspectives of how to walk in that Christ law. All right? Well, I pray something was said today that ignited something in you. I pray that something was given that totally and completely transformed your life. Um, today, we're going to be done with this particular teaching. Um, and we're going to come back next week and we're going to talk more about this uh, succinctly. Um, 